And let all flesh bless his holy name forever and ever. So we pray. Lord, as we think about you, your creative acts, we think about your character, your nature, your goodness, your mercy your grace, your love. Lord, our hearts are raised towards you in songs of praise and thanksgiving that we should know you, that you should know us, and that we could love and fellowship together with you. Lord, we pray that your Holy Spirit will just open our hearts now to the understanding of your truth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. This afternoon, about 2.30, we'll be catching a bus here at the church, which will take us up to the airport, where we will catch a SAS flight to Copenhagen, transferring tomorrow around noon to a flight to Tel Aviv, where we will meet up with the rest of our group that have, for the most part, gone on before us. Uh, some left yesterday, others left this morning. We'll be leaving, bringing up the tail end this afternoon. But for the next couple of weeks, we'll be in Israel and then in Greece, uh, just enjoying the blessings of traveling the steps of Christ and then later the steps of Paul around Athens and Corinth and other places that have become familiar to us because of the New Testament. In our absence, we have really a tremendous um, group of speakers that are coming. It sort of reminds me of, of the little boy who his pet turtle died. And so the parents were wondering just how they would break the news to him because he really loved this little turtle. And so the dad said to the mom, well, let me handle it. And so when the little boy came home from school, the dad sat down and began to explain to him about life and disappointments and tragedies that happen and how we have to make the best of things. And he said, it's, it's good to sort of divert your attention when tragedy comes to something that is more pleasant and happy. So he said, son, I have some sad news for you. He said, your turtle died today. But I thought it would maybe be just a good time for us to just sort of, well, let's just go out and, and we'll sort of think good thoughts. Maybe we should go to Disneyland and we'll eat there tonight and we'll ride the rides and we'll just sort of have a wonderful time this afternoon, you know, so that we won't be buried in the sorrow of the fact that the turtle died. Just about that time, the turtle poked its head out of the shell and began to walk. And the little boy says, let's kill him. <laughs> And so I'm not going to be here for the next couple of weeks, but the replacements we have are so great, I'm afraid you're going to be saying, let's kill him before I get back. <laughs> Thank you, Jeff. <laughs> But Greg Laurie will be here next Sunday, 
and uh, then the following Sunday, Chuck Jr. Tonight, Pastor Romain. Thursday night, Roger Oakland, a special series on prophecy, the New Age movement, and how it figures in. And so we're leaving you in good hands. We will be praying for you as we covet your prayers for us. A lot of exciting things going on over there. We're going to be able to uh, see a lot of things this year that we haven't been able to see in the past. I'm very anxious to see the archaeological diggings that are under the uh, uh, western wall area there. In the western wall area, the tunnel of the rabbis is going to be open to us this year. And just a lot of exciting things to learn over there. So we're really looking forward to the trip. And I haven't been to Greece for so many years I'm looking forward to standing again on Mars Hill and thinking about Paul and his uh, proclamation of the gospel to the Epicurean philosophers there. And so uh, it's going to be a great time, and we're looking forward to it. Also, always, though, looking forward to getting home. You know, it's, it's great to see the old world, to travel up and down, to visit all those places of history and renown, but always wonderful to be home again. This morning, we want to look at verse 8 and 9 of, of this psalm of David, this praise of David. We praise the Lord, but for good reason. And David not only tells of his praise of God, but he gives some of the reasons for that praise. The nature of God. For the Lord is gracious. He's full of compassion. He is slow to anger and of great mercy. The Lord is good to all, and his tender mercies are over all his works. Now for a moment I want to digress and I want to go way out uh, around and then hopefully come back, bring you back to, to the text. But um, I'm afraid that a lot of people have the wrong idea of what a Christian is. And if I should ask you, just what is a Christian? we get a wide variety of answers. There are some people who believe that they are Christians because they belong to a particular church. They were baptized by the church when they were infants. They even went to confirmation classes when they were older. They attend church on special occasions. Weddings, funerals, sometimes Easter and Christmas. And they're listed on the church roll. And thus they are depending upon the church to save them. And you ask them, are you a Christian? And they'll say, well, I am. And then they'll name the brand of church they go to. And they're depending upon that. And that's what they think a Christian is person who was baptized when they were an infant and who attends church occasionally. There are others who believe that they are Christians because they were born in the USA. And after all, isn't this a Christian nation? And I'm not an atheist. I believe in the good old boy upstairs. And they even call upon God in special occasions when they are facing a disaster or they want him to damn someone uh, they'll call upon him there are still others who believe that they are Christians because they attend church regularly they support it consistently with their ties they even teach a Sunday school class, and they are considered active members by their church. They've got a long 
roll of faithful attendance pins through the years. Now, a Christian will do some of these things, but doing these things does not make you a Christian. You may do all of these things and still not be a Christian. Jesus said, not everyone who says, Lord, Lord, is going to enter into the kingdom of heaven. It is for certain that no one is going to enter the kingdom of heaven who has not said, Lord, Lord, to Jesus. But not everyone who says, Lord, Lord, is going to enter. Jesus gave a parable. He said there was a father who had two sons. And he said to his sons, go out and work in my vineyard today. And the first said, son said, no way, I don't want to. The second son said, sure, Dad, I'll be glad to. Now the first son repented of his attitude and he went out and worked that day in the vineyard. The second son never showed up in the vineyard. Jesus said, now which one did the will of his father? And they said, well, the second. And Jesus said, you have judged rightly. It isn't what I say. Not saying, Lord, Lord, though that's important to say, that doesn't guarantee my being a Christian. Jesus said, not all who say, Lord, Lord, are going to enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who doeth the will of the Father. Now, a Christian is one who has surrendered his life to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Jesus said, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and yet you do not do the things that I say? Jesus is saying, it isn't words only, it's deeds, it's actions. This means that I turn my life over to be controlled, governed, directed by him. Jesus said, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. You see, it isn't just coming to Jesus, it's taking his yoke upon us. That is, submitting myself to his will, bending my neck under his yoke, allowing him to take the reins of my life and beginning now to guide my life in his path. It is the surrendering of my will to his. Now, the Bible teaches us that God is sovereign. That God has created the universe and that God sovereignly rules over the universe. And that God, in his sovereignty, is irresistible. He does what he wishes, and no man can stay his hand. He reigns supreme, and he can do whatever he wills, and there is no power of man who can resist the will of God. The Bible teaches that, and I believe that. However, 
The Bible also teaches that God in his sovereign will has willed that man should also have the capacity of choice. And God in his sovereignty has granted unto man the power of choosing his own destiny. So that God does not force himself nor his will upon man. Though he is sovereign and surely could, he has chosen in his sovereignty rather to just grant man the liberty of making his own decisions and his own choices. So that I have the capacity of choosing my own master. Now, I am aware that I exist just at God's caprice. God is under no obligation to me to keep me alive for another moment. God has control over my life and can do with me whatever he desires at any time. He's sovereign. The sustaining of my life is totally in the hands of God. I am here today because God has not yet ordained to take me home. And I will continue to be here until God does ordain to take me home or to send me to Hawaii. When Daniel was brought in before King Belshazzar, that Babylonian king, the grandson of Nebuchadnezzar, who was having a big party with a thousand of his lords and princes, and during this drunken orgy, he ordered them to bring in the gold and silver vessels that his grandfather had taken from the temple in Jerusalem that had been sanctified in the service to God. And he began to drink his wine out of these gold and silver vessels as he praised the gods of gold and silver. Suddenly there appeared a hand on the wall and there was writing on the wall that caused him great consternation and fear. And trembling, he called for the wise men to interpret the writing, which they were unable to do. Finally, Daniel was brought in and he first of all rebuked Belshazzar. He said, your father your grandfather, Nebuchadnezzar, was given this great kingdom by God. And being lifted up in pride, God allowed him experiences to realize that it was God who rules, God who is sovereign, God who reigns and puts on the throne those who he will and brings down those who he will. And this very God, your grandfather recognized, but this very God in whose hand your breath is, is you have not glorified but instead you praise the gods of gold and silver and so God is terminating your reign this night your soul will be required of you your kingdom's going to be divided among the Medes and the Persians and, and you've had it it's all over the very God in whose hand your breath is you see you your next breath, you're depending upon God for it. You exist only because God in his sovereignty has ordained that you should exist up to this moment. But at any moment, God can call an end to any of our lives, to our existence. He is sovereign. God is the potter. I am the clay. And as the clay, I have no say in the determination of, of what I am going to be. That's in the hands of the potter. With the exception that God in his sovereignty has given to me the capacity of choice. And I can choose whom I will serve.
God does not force me to serve him. God does not want me to serve him out of coercion. God wants me to serve him out of willingness on my part. He wants my service to him to be joyful. God doesn't want you doing something for him and then griping for a month over what you've done or go around and complaining about all you have to do or all you've been doing for the Lord. The Bible tells us that what we give should never be out of pressure, out of constraint. God loves a hilarious giver. He wants whatever you do for him to be done with hilarity, joy, happiness. Now, God, because he does not force his will upon your life, but has given you the capacity of choice, the choice of a master, seeks then by his love and by your understanding of his nature, he seeks to draw you into surrendering your life to him. Doesn't force you, doesn't pressure you, seeks to draw you. And thus, God has revealed himself in the Bible. And David here is praising the Lord, and as he praises the Lord, speaking of the character and nature of God, he gives you the reasons why he was praising the Lord. For the Lord is gracious. He is full of compassion. He is slow to anger. He is of great mercy. The Lord is good to all, and his tender mercies are over all of his works. So giving you a little bit of an understanding of God. Now the Bible not only reveals to us the nature of God, but it also reveals to us the spirit world. And it makes us aware that the spirit world is divided into two opposing forces. The spirit world of good, which is in submission to God, and the spirit world of evil, which is following after the rebellion of Satan. And these are your choices. You either choose to surrender your life to God, to serve Him, or you surrender your life to Satan to serve him. Now, God seeks to appeal to your spiritual nature and seeks to draw you by his love to a surrendering of yourself to his love. Whereas Satan seeks to appeal to the sensual side of man. That sensual side, which is called by the psychologist, the body drives. The thirst drive, the hunger drive, the sex drives. And Satan seeks to drive you, and thus you're a, you see a person driven to serve Satan. And they, they, they are as though they are possessed and driven to sin. Whereas God draws by love to himself. And each man then makes his choice whether I or not I will become a servant to Satan, to sin, serving Satan, or a servant of righteousness, serving God. And every man makes the choice because not to serve one is to serve the other. And you can't serve them both. No man can serve two masters. You cannot serve God and mammon. You cannot have two things that are mastering your life. Only one can master your life. And you make the choice. Is your life to be mastered by the spirit or is your life to be mastered by the senses, your flesh? The choice that each man makes makes. Now, our text 
is a part of God's revelation of himself to us in order that we might be drawn and attracted to him, that we would choose to surrender ourselves to a God who is gracious, compassionate, merciful, good. And so David talks about, I will extol the Lord. I will praise him and all because the Lord is gracious. That is, God is good to those that don't deserve it. As I look at God's blessings upon my life, I realize how gracious he is. I see the things that God has done for me. I look around and, and I'm just so overwhelmed with God's grace towards me. I know that I do not deserve all of the blessings that God has bestowed upon my life. God is so gracious. He doesn't force his way. He doesn't coerce a person. He's gracious. He allows you to freely make your own choice. He doesn't use any high-handed methods or high-pressure tactics with you. It's always that gentle, loving, wooing and drawing of the spirit to spirit. Satan and his methods is act exactly the opposite. He gets you in the little room, closes the door, turns the heat on, and uh, you begin to feel this driven pressure, you know, this restlessness, this tenseness, this drive, drive, got to. The Lord is full of compassion. He isn't just compassionate. He is full of compassion. Now, this is one of the characteristics that became garbled by religion. I believe that religion is man-made. I believe that religion is man's endeavors to understand and to reach God. And thus, I believe that religion has always confused and clouded the true issues of God. And many people miss and lose God completely because of religion. Because I believe that religion leads man into confusion and into darkness concerning God. And this is where religion garbled the whole concept of God. Man lost the truth concerning God. And the religion began to teach that God was constantly angry, vengeful, filled with wrath, ready to smite you down the moment you made one little error, one little step from the right path and You've had it. And they began to paint God with a picture of heavy-handed judgment. Now, this came to pass because God, knowing all things, laid out the rules for a good life, a happy, prosperous life. And God said, this is what you should do, and this is what you should not do. Now, God knew the consequences of certain activities. And so God said, if you do this, then this is going to happen. 
Now, God knows all things, and he, and he just knew that. He knows that there are certain activities that if you engage in those activities, they are going to bring inevitable consequences in your life. And knowing that, God warned of the consequences of doing these wrong things. In an endeavor to persuade you to exercise your choice not to do those things that inherently are destructive and hurtful. Now, man, in rebelling against God, doing those things that God said he should not do, the moment the consequences that God had warned about took place in his life, then he shakes his fist at God and said, I hate God. I don't know why God would do this to me. God didn't do it to you. He told you that would happen if you did those things. Because God knows the inevitable consequences of certain actions and activities uh, by man. God knows that if you become sexually promiscuous, it's going to have a certain effect upon your body. And thus God warned of the consequences that would take place. God knows that uh, the introduction into your body of foreign protein, uh, it, the body has to build up an immunity to that foreign protein. And that if you are engaged in promiscuous sexual activity where the body has to be constantly developing new immunities, you can break down your immune system. And knowing that, God warned man to not become sexually promiscuous. Now Satan on the other side is driving a person to that promiscuity. That sex drive becomes a very powerful, overwhelming kind of a drive. And a person is out looking, you know, for uh, new experiences and all. And, and, and yet God says, no, no, no. This is intended as, as an experience of deep intimacy within marriage and it can bring forth the fruit, the, the beautiful children that can be raised then in that environment of love and also the society and mankind can be perpetuated here on the planet. But you see, Man disregarding the warnings of God, going ahead and doing those things that God said he should not do, he begins to suffer the inevitable consequences. But then in his folly, he turns around and seeks to blame God for the consequences because God declared these would be the consequences. But God was just warning in advance, that's the consequence. I can tell you, look, if you jump off of the building over there, you're going to break your leg. Now, if you jump off the building and break your leg, I'm not responsible for breaking your leg. And it would be wrong to blame me and say, why, why didn't you do that to me? Why would you break my leg? I didn't break your leg. You broke your leg by jumping off the building. You know, you're responsible for the broken leg, not me. I just warn you, that's what happens if you try and jump off of a two-story building. I just happen to know a little bit about the body and the fact that the bones can't take that kind of a jar and, and that the legs are the things that will probably snap under such pressure. And yet, people do that with God, and thus they begin to misunderstand God. They see only the heavy hand. They see only, you know, well, God is judging or God is fierce, God is angry, God is cruel, God is mean, you know, and, and, and they get this false concept of God when the truth is God is full of compassion. Now, because the religious leaders had garbled the concept of God, in order that man might truly understand God, he sent his only begotten Son to clarify the truth of God. And one of the things that Jesus was constantly demonstrating was that God is full of compassion. 
Over and over in the Gospels you read where Jesus had compassion on them. And seeing the multitudes, he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. They, they had no purpose. They were just wandering aimlessly. And as he looks at mankind just wandering aimlessly, no purpose in life, just existing, the Lord has compassion. My wife watched an interview on 2020 this week of Ted Turner. And she said that he made a very remarkable statement to the effect that success was empty, but that is only known by those who have attained it. For Barbara Walters was talking to him about his finally being recognized, you know, he was sort of looked down upon this trying to create a new network and all, and, but now he's being consulted and, and he's being recognized of having established this new strong network in America, and, and he's achieved the success and all. He says, well, he said, you go from cradle to the grave, you got to do something. But he said, success isn't what it's blown up to be when you finally get there. And the Lord knows that. He looks upon man and he sees them just going aimlessly through life like sheep without a shepherd. No one to guide them, no one to lead them, and, and thus they just wander aimlessly. So many times when Jesus would come against or come to a person who was infirmed in some way or the other, it said he, would, he looked with compassion upon them the weaknesses, the infirmities of man. And in Jesus, we again have a clear picture of what God is like. But even men have taken then and made a religion of Christianity and garbled the whole thing again. So that, you know, they, they have you know, built their monuments and all, and said, well, no, this is what, you know, it's all about. And, and, and they've, they've got things just as confused as ever uh, by instituting it or trying to institute it into a religious system. There's a vast difference between religion and Christianity. Whereas religion is man's endeavor to reach God, Christianity is God's endeavor to reach man. Where religion is man stretching out, trying to touch the infinite God. Christianity is the infinite God reaching down and touching the finite man. Now immediately you can see the vast difference. Because I can see where it is totally impossible for a finite man to touch an infinite God. There's no way but I can see where it would be very simple for an infinite God to touch a finite man. And so if I'm going to come in touch with God, it must be God who initiates that touch, the infinite God reaching down to touch me, and God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. He reached down to touch the finite man. Jesus sought to bring to us the true understanding of God by referring to him as our Father in heaven. And in so doing, he was seeking to gather into their minds all of those excellent characteristics of fatherhood. A father who loves his child, a father who cares for his child, a father who was willing to sacrifice for his child and give the best that he had for his child's sake. And if you had that kind of a father 
who loved you, who made you feel loved and secured, who made you feel that you were the most wonderful person in the world, who was always there loving, understanding, caring for you first. Then put that right close to the top of the list of blessings for you have been blessed to have that kind of a dad. And right up close to the top of my list of blessings is the dad that God gave to me. <laughs> what a rooter and supporter he was of his son. I could score a touchdown Thousands of people yelling in the stands. I would hear his voice above the others. Always. He'd cheer longer than anybody else, too. <laughs> and on the way home, congratulating and oh, it just support, support, love, care. And thus, I find it very easy to relate to my Heavenly Father, and I do so with a warmth. And a, and a feeling of security and love and acceptance. My heart goes out to you who have not had fathers who really gave you that kind of support. There are many people today who have great difficulty now in relating to God because of bad experiences with men who were fathers only in a biological sense but were never truly fathers to their children. They never did give them that love, that sense of acceptance no matter what, that support. And thus, when you talk about God as a heavenly father, they have difficulty in, in relating to God in that way. And my heart goes out to them. They are missing out so much of the true understanding of God as a father, caring, loving, concerned father. And it's tragic that they've experienced just a man in their life who cared not for them, perhaps even abused them. What a travesty and what a tragedy. What an awesome responsibility we fathers have to our children to be to them an example of the Heavenly Father so that they can relate to God in a very meaningful way. Every one of you dads, You're setting patterns in your children's minds that will help them to relate to God or hinder their relationship to God. The psalmist tells us that he is slow to anger. Why? What a difference that is from the concept that many people have of God who is just ready to smite you down the moment you make a mistake. A God who's just waiting, just waiting. You know, one little misstep and wham, you've had it. No, he's slow to anger. He's so patient with us, with our weaknesses, with our failures. I developed a technique of teaching my children to walk, teaching them to ride bicycles, teaching them to swim. For I believe it's all a matter of confidence. And so I developed techniques to sort of help their confidence, believing I can do it. And, and I can remember when my dad was teaching me to ride a bike. 
he would run alongside holding the back of the seat so that, you know, I could get the balance, and he'd run alongside of me as I was riding my bike. And then I remember he said, Son, I wasn't holding on to the bike for the last hundred feet. <laughs> you weren't? I, mean, I was riding a bike? <laughs> From then on, man, I rode everywhere. <laughs> I had confidence. I can ride a bike. And so I, I took that, and so with the children, to teach them to walk. Uh, hold them out at arm's length and hold them good pressure against their little waist, holding them up, holding them so they can balance, getting them to stand there. But gradually I would release the pressure until they'd be standing there not really knowing it. My, I'd take sort of my hands, I'd take the pressure off, and they'd still be standing there. And then suddenly they realize, I'm standing, what am I doing standing? They sit down, you know. <laughs> you say, no, 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 you were standing. Come on, let's stand up, you know, and you hold them up again. And, and they get confidence, well, I can stand. And then you pull your hands around and say, okay, now take a step to daddy. Come on, walk. And, and you get them to take that first step. Maybe two or three steps. And of course, you hug them and you pat them and say, oh, great, great, you can walk, you can walk. And then when you hold your hands out and they turn around and start the other direction, you know they've got it. <laughs> They're walking. But it's that confidence, and it's instilling that confidence. Now, when you're seeking to teach them these things, water skiing or whatever, when you're seeking to teach them and to help them to develop these skills, when they fail, when they fall, you don't pick them up and begin to beat them and say, I said walk, you little brat. Why would you fall? No, you don't do that. You encourage them. You say, now you can do it. I know you can do it. And yet somehow people seem to think that our Heavenly Father, the moment I fail, the moment I fall, He's just ready to wham me. You know, why did you do that? How could you do that? You know, and, and, and though God is just angry with me, turned against me, but our Heavenly Father is slow to anger because He's merciful. He's of great mercy over all of His works. And so it is important that we have a true concept of God, not one that's been garbled by religion, not one that's been garbled by man's ideas, but we come back to the revelation itself. God's revelation of himself. For the Lord is gracious. He's full of compassion. He is slow to anger. He's of great mercy. And he's good to all. Shall we pray? Father, we thank you that you have revealed yourself, that we might know you in order that we might make a wise choice as to who will control our destiny, whether or not we will follow our sensual body drives in serving our flesh and Satan, or whether we will follow the leading of the Spirit to live a life in loving relationship with you, allowing you by your love to control our future. Lord, help people to understand the truth about Christianity. It's not the works that I do for you in a church. It is the work that you did for me on the cross and my surrendering to that love 
that placed you there. And may, Lord, I yield myself to you to follow and to serve. In Jesus' name, amen. Shall we stand? And so today, God in his sovereignty has given to you the choice of who you will serve. And if you came in today serving your flesh, living after the flesh, you can choose to continue that life. You should be warned that there are certain inevitable consequences to that life. And God, in his love, has given that warning. If you, and you can go home, you can leave here choosing to continue after the flesh. I mean, God has given you that choice. But the truth is also that today you can choose to live a new life, free from the power and the driving power of the flesh. You can live a new life after the Spirit, walking in fellowship with God, filled with the power of God, experiencing and knowing the love of God. For he is gracious and full of compassion. Your choice. You're driven to one. You're drawn to the other. But nonetheless, ultimately, you choose. Not to choose one is to choose the other. So the choice is made always. There's no neutrality here. You can't wash your hands. The choice is made. I pray God will help you to make that choice that will count for eternity. May the Lord be with you. And may the Lord bless you. And I, of course it would be totally wrong I guess not to tell you, you can go back to the prayer room and make the choice back there if you like. Pastors will be back there to pray with you. And you can choose life. The Lord said, choose you this day. I, get, I lay before you life and death. Choose this day. Choose life, he said, that you may live. For I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked. And, but yet, being sovereign, he, he's placed that choice in man's hands. And now we have to exercise that choice whether I will yield myself to the sovereign God or in rebellion against him. May the Lord be with you, watch over and keep you in his love. During this time of our absence from each other, we covet your prayers. We'll surely be praying for you. That God will strengthen you by his spirit, that you might be able to comprehend what is the length and the breadth and the depth and the height of God's love for you? And that you might live and walk in that love. A life filled with richness and fullness in Christ. In Jesus' name. The Lord bless thee, Lord bless thee and keep thee. And keep thee. The Lord may And now, on behalf of The Word for Today, the broadcast ministry of Pastor Chuck Smith, we thank you for joining us in today's broadcast. For more of Pastor Chuck's studies and biblical teaching resources, visit our website at pastorchuck.org. You can contact The Word for Today at The Word for Today. 
P.O. Box 890-820, Temecula, California, 92589. Or email us at infopastorchuck at gmail.com. We'll return with more of our verse-by-verse Bible study in our next broadcast with Pastor Chuck.